with is ENTP challenges Darwin. Explain the Cambrian explosion. And so that is part one of my theory of everything. And when I say ENTP challenges Darwin, Darwin, I really just mean ENTP challenges anyone, whether you believe in, whether you're an evolutionist or not. I just thought evolution had basically been proven, but it's called a theory of evolution and theories, they, there has not been enough evidence to prove them. But I don't know why I just I you know I took biology and I learned you know uh, kingdom phylum uh, class order family genus species and apparently now domains at the top and maybe I think it was even then but I was like what's dumb domain you don't need domain like it just messes everything up this like uh king philip came over from great spain i could have used that in high school Mon mono monomic device how do you say that i have to find my theory of everything folder there's so much stuff in it oh my gosh i'm gonna try to give an overview of two events i will try to fill in the gaps uh for my lack of explanation with slides and stuff uh because i'm gonna mess up on dates and i'll just probably just mess up on everything but A lot of people say the earth is 4.6 billion years old oh i don't know everybody disagrees about how how old the world is and now it says gyr what the heck does that mean it looks like euro uh who knows we have the first cells showing up around 4 billion years ago not too long after the earth came into fruition from 4.1 billion years ago all the way to 3.5 billion years ago all you had was single-celled life and they call it anaerobic because these little cells figured out how to function without o2 without oxygen so the environment of the earth the early earth was very low possibly completely absent, a uh, lacking in oxygen. But life finds a way. That's my favorite line in Jurassic Park. Uh, Dr. Ian Malcolm, where he's talking about how the dinosaurs came onto the island, he, he said, life finds a way. That's one of my favorite things that he says. And then all of a sudden, between 3 billion years ago and 2.5 billion years ago, the percentage of oxygen rapidly increases. This is the first time that... O2 dioxygen 
was induced into Earth's atmosphere. This is what uh, science has been unable to explain. So the anaerobic uh, single-celled organisms, they're chilling forever. They've got command of the planet for billions of years. Suddenly, for some reason, O2 arrives on the scene. And this is the first great mass extinction in the history of the Earth. Because with this sudden influx of oxygen in the atmosphere, damn breaks throughout the Earth, uh, they are all wiped out. They, they can't live, you know, because they figured out how to exist in a different kind of atmosphere. And maybe like deep in the sea and who knows. And then the first bacteria show up, the first photosynthetic bacteria show up on the scene. The first uh, organisms that could use the sunlight to reproduce uh, the sunlight and carbon dioxide and oxygen. So from this point, the oxygen just keeps increasing and increasing and increasing until you get to a point that oxygen is almost 50% higher than it is today. And it's fascinating because there is a chart here and it shows that every time there is something uh, drastic or dramatic that occurs in the Earth's atmosphere, whether going up or down, a mass extinction happens. The mass extinctions happen over and over in Earth's history. So oxygen continues to go up, and so you have the 50% levels higher. So that's when giant flying insects appear. Okay, so we go from, you know, um, 2.5 billion years ago with the first photo photosynthetic, first aerobic bacteria, before that the photosynthetic bacteria. 500 million years ago you have the first chordates, and chordates, I think those, uh, those are animals with spines, maybe like amphibians? I don't know. Uh, we'll get back to that. And then giant flying insects. Okay, so that's 250 million years ago now. This is preceding the Cambrian explosion. As soon as all this O2 is everywhere, all over the place, then the biology of the Earth takes a completely different form. Before that, for billions of years on Earth, I mean billions of years, all that existed, if there was life at all, were, you know, single-celled anaerobes. And from the beginning of time, basically, uh, beginning of lifetime to 2.5 billion years ago. So that's 4.5 billion years ago. Just here's three to 4.5, you know, and then here's two a billion years ago, and then one billion years ago, and then 500 million years ago, all the way to here. It's just anaerobes. And then here's 500 million years ago to, to earliest humans you know so it's just like these little teeny things way down here even smaller uh, so this is where complex life shows up and this is where everything else ha happened in the history of the earth like we're just this little teeny tiny blip over here but the earth has been dominated up to that point by bacteria and you know other a couple of cells hanging out little beasts so that's insane that was just necessary to sort of explain, I guess, where life came from, not why life came. I have no idea why these oxygen events happened, although I do have some theories. But the period that they call the oxygen crisis, it was the predecessor to multicellular life. this oxygenic event had to happen for multicellular life to exist. Now we're to the Cambrian explosion, which is the meat and potatoes of this and my favorite part. Basically, life just shows up and Darwin couldn't explain it. 
he couldn't explain where life came from. He went to his deathbed with this great vexation. You know, he built his trees of evolution and, and he wrote this like detailed book and this is how this came from this and that and this and that and this and that. And it all sounded very plausible. It sounded so plausible that I never even really looked into it and thought it was like, I just thought it was an accepted, like not theory. I just thought it was accepted, but it is a theory. And then I found out what um, transitions were. And for Darwin's theory to be correct, transitions have to exist. Transitions that show these little selective uh, According to Darwin, it was genetic mutations that were completely random in certain species and certain organisms, and there would be random mutations that had absolutely no reason for popping up. And if it was a good mutation, then that species or organism of whatever kind would keep it, and then they would keep on propagating it. So his theory, they call it a bottom-up approach, is that, you know, everything started from these little cells, and then everything somehow branched off and became what you see today. which is why we have descended from the apes and the Australopithecus and Homo erectus and Homo naledi and Homo, I don't know, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of homos, okay? Uh, it's true. Even listening to some of these paleontologists and archaeologists talk about it, they are like, oh, this homo and that homo, and it's like, whoa. And I watched this amazing BBC documentary called Darwin's Dilemma in doing my research for this, and I will link it below. And I would encourage everyone and their mom and their cousin and their dogs and their parakeets to watch it because it was the most amazing thing to watch. And I... I literally, my jaw was hanging open the entire time because like so much of it was news to me. And, you know, I'd been researching that and I was like, huh? And so I watched this and I was like, what the heck? I didn't know Darwin was vexed. Actually, I already did know that, but I didn't quite understand it or understand why, but I'd saved little snippets and things. But this documentary did such a great job of explaining it. To have the bottom up approach, there would have to be fossil records of it for, uh, that show how life had gradually became what you see today. But they don't exist. There are no transitions.
the first fossil records that we have of life show that life came to us prepackaged this way. And when the Cambrian explosion happened and we went from multicellular organisms and bacteria to suddenly fish and sea life and, uh, you know, uh, vertebrates and soft bodied animals and, uh, you know, exo animals with exoskeletons and then flying animals eventually, although that didn't come for a while, but everything came, everything showed up on the scene as is. The lack of transitions is astonishing. Basically, Darwin's entire theory is unsupported scientifically. It's a great theory and it sounds amazing. It sounds right. It's there. There is no evidence to support it at all. What actually there is evidence for is a top down approach. And the BBC documentary explained this so cool because they said it's a lot like when humans invent things. Like, think of the automobile, right? When uh, he said when Ford and Benz got together to make the first automobile, uh, they put together a package that, when you look at the body style, you know, and the tires and the wheels and the ignition, all these things. Yeah, there are a lot more advanced cars around these days, but if you look at them and compare them next to each other, they've got a lot of the same parts. Sure, things get modified and things get faster and more efficient and more pretty and more fancy and more this and more that. What he was saying was that something with reason intervened in our reality to make that automobile appear and it didn't just start with like this and that and this and that you know and like eventually it grew into a car no it showed up as a car like that was the inspiration and that was the invention and since then it's pretty much looked like that uh, if you want to argue with that you can but that was pretty damn logical to me And that's how animal life showed up on the planet, it, the same way the automobile did. There, there's nothing in between these multicellular organisms and bacteria and the first life that exploded out of the earth in the Cambrian explosion. So Darwin's thing and a lot of the early evolutionists and evolutions now say, okay, well, the fossil record is just incomplete. And, and obviously they were soft bodied organisms. So things like washed away or whatever, but they have found where they have found, you know, Cambrian fossils way down in the shoal, uh, soft bodied, or sponges. They were able to find sponge embryos from like 200 million years before that or whatever. Before the first little swimming hard shell, whatever it was, horseshoe crab or something like that, like the first horseshoe crab. In the gap that should have showed here is this horseshoe crab that was hard and that's why it got preserved. Um, a sponge was preserved. And there is nothing in between the sponge and the horseshoe crab and nothing in between the cyanobacteria and the sponge.
for a long time too. They said, "Oh, we just don't have the technology. It must it must be in the sediment at the bottom of the earth." But when man started drilling for oil in these big tankers and these huge drills, they went and like would push down these big hollow pipes or drills or whatever you call into the rock, and the result was that they would pull out tons of the bottom of the ocean. And the bottom of the ocean, I guess, there used to be a lot more phosphorus in the ocean, and it, so it was able to preserve things that would never be preservable now. And none of that supports evolution. There is nothing in there that shows that these huge missing gaps or missing links uh, that would be absolutely necessary for evolution to be true. And most of the major, most if not all of the major body uh, blueprints for animals showed up during the Cambrian explosion in the very beginning, you know, and some things are extinct now, but whatever is here now, um, most if not all of it showed up during this explosive time in history, all the way up until first man showed up. Uh, and ain't nothing changed so much. The automobile hasn't changed so much since then, uh, as far as the species that are still alive today. Speciation always happens, and I completely believe that, uh, where little uh, things, modifiers happen, especially, you know, separated geographically, or some things do work better, you know, I, I think that is an absolute truth. Uh, there's something called genetic drift, uh, which happens when you take a species and you separate it, you know, and that's what Darwin found on the Galapagos. And that is the thing, you know, there's speciation. Animals change due to their environment. You can call it evolution if you want. You can call it whatever you want. It's adaptive. It's adaptive and it does seem to be more than random, doesn't it? Because uh, Darwin's whole thing was that it was just completely random. And also part of the BBC documentary broke down what the chances would be of these random random mutations first of all happening because it is completely like one chance i can't even i don't remember the thing he used basically it's hugely unlikely for even one genetic mutation to happen in a species over a period of however many trillions of years let alone the succession of mutations that would be necessary in every single species to create darwin's theory It is absolutely ridiculous. Evolution is a ridiculous theory. And I had no idea. I believed it. And I figured that I, I, I could, I was able to make it work with God even, or I was trying to, that's part of what I was doing. And then the more I learned, the more I was like, okay. I no longer believe in evolution, uh, unless say, someone can prove it to me.
Oh, okay. By the way, if you want to form your own theories at this point, then I would just turn this video off now because I'm just going to say really quickly what I think. And if you want to hear what I have to say, then hang in. And if you're completely sick of my voice, I understand completely. I hear my voice in my head all day, but a lot of the night. So, so it won't hurt my feelings. evolution I just thought that it had already been proven and maybe that sounds dumb to everyone watching but I thought I had it was just proven I was in the process of making it make sense with God and I wasn't finding I wasn't even in the process of it I think I pretty much accepted it and it made complete sense to me but I hadn't dissected it and when I dissected it what I found uh makes way more sense. There's tons of Christians out there that completely get behind science, but there are a, a split between the scientific Christians. Uh, and this isn't Christian science for anyone watching this. It just means that Christian rationals, maybe, or anybody that uh, is very interested in biology and science and physics and, and things like that. Many people actually find God that way. There are evolutionist Christians, and then there are, I guess you could say creationist Christians, but with a scientific foundation. So I didn't know that. I didn't know any of that. I didn't know. I just didn't know. My take on it comes from uh, C.S. Lewis, who is kind of like, he, he's a, a Christian apologetic. He wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but he also wrote Mere Christianity, Screwtape Letters, Miracles, uh the four loves uh, and uh, other things that I'm not thinking of right now. And those books were very influential on me, especially in my walk toward becoming a Christian, you know, which is relatively new for me, but it makes the most sense. And like I had faith and I believed in God uh, and I was solid in my belief before I found these eight, my eight things on the short list, my eight huge things on my short, short list. And there's probably even more, but to me, it's, uh, it's, the most amazing proof of God, the, it's hard proof of God. And it is fascinating to me, the lengths that people have gone to, to try to unsee it or disprove it or anything, anything, but to admit or even entertain the possibility of an intelligent creator. Um, but anyway, C.S. Lewis is, is to apologetics in Christianity what like Einstein uh, is, was, it was and is to, you know, mathematics and physics and what uh, Hubble uh, is, was and is to astronomy and cosmology and everything else is, is all kind of intermingled. I mean, all of that stuff is all in one big package. So that's how I think of C.S. Lewis anyway. And he said, um, one of the amazing things he said anyway, about naturalism, you know, people who just think that we're all just matter, athe atheists, naturalists, whatever you want to call them. A lot of the problem with naturalism is that it, it takes irrational irrationality, uh, no reason, basically, and it comes to reason. And you can't get, you can't derive reason or rationality from irrationality or chaos or or nature. So he's basically saying, here's nature and here's reason. And he says, look around you, everything that you see in front of you, you know, from the walls to your filed nails, to what you're wearing, uh, everything that you can see, where you are right now, why you are there, everything is a product of reason, of human reason, you know, that road that, you know, everything that if you look around you, it came from humans. And where did it come from? From our consciousness, from our ability to reason. Um, he says that reason can invade nature. He says, although it's a lot more like, like a beam of light shining into the darkness and making sense of things. Uh, he said, if nature had its way, do you think anything you would see anything that you see around you right now? Because nature 
would just be nature, you know? Uh, nature wouldn't go and set up cities and file your nails and make sense and order out of the world and a lot of chaos and disaster, too. But the point is, everything that you see is a product of our reason. You know, it's not a product of an, something that an animal did. It's not a product of something that, you know, the forest just walked over and said, this would be a good idea. You know, um, reason can invade or direct or make sense of, of nature, but everything you see around you is an intervention of reason of something greater than nature so how it could reason how could this have come from nature it, it, the relationship it's not a two-way relationship they don't both influence each other sometimes a hurricane happens you know or something like that um but that isn't that isn't nature trying to make sense or anything like that you know there's no rhyme or reason to that there's no reason for it so the relationship it goes all one way nature doesn't bounce back and do to reason what reason can do to nature so everything that you see around you was an intervention of reason onto nature meaning that we couldn't have come from nature because uh reason has to come from reason you know rationale and rationality has to come from other rationality and if you keep going back you will find a great rationality behind everything rational and all reasoning so because reason has to come from reason and rationality has to come from rationality first of all that means that our brains and our consciousness that it's our direct link to god it's our direct link to rationality which wouldn't have existed it wouldn't have existed it wouldn't have just like tumbled out of the algae the blue green algae or out of a kangaroo's pouch you know uh reason doesn't exist anywhere else in nature reason exists in in humans this the kind of reasoning and forethought and emotions and selfless acts and i mean i could go on for days about all the traits that are unique to humans that are not found anywhere else in the animal world you know and, and nothing else in nature nothing in nature could have done to the earth what we've done or, or society or you know uh nothing behaves the way that humans do so just like with the automobile we presented the product first we have a top-down approach here is the the oh here's the big picture here's the automobile and then we fine-tune it and fine-tune it and fine-tune it you know until it looks exactly how we want it to but we don't start you know uh with like the knob for the you know shifter and then pretty soon it's got a stick on it and then maybe you know that's not how it goes it's a top down it's the big picture first because we are big picture thinkers humans intervened humans intervened to make the roads and the planes and everything that you see around around you is humans intervening in nature so what he's what i i am doing with that concept is looking at the fossil record and every time my cheeks are getting so pink i've got to turn down the heat and i'm all excited the podcast i listened to today which is an unbelievable podcast and i'll link that too it talks about homo nadelli and you know what does it imply about the first adam and eve but uh the homo nadelli discovery in africa i think last year sometime in south africa one of the researchers who was on said it really well um he said every time there's a demarcation in evolution, every time there is like a a catastrophic change, basically, you, you can take that as an example of God intervening. So uh, the Cambrian explosion and land and life just showing up out of nowhere, you know, with no evolutionary tree as Darwin so neatly packaged it. Um, that's God intervening. That would be God stepping in and creating, be and, and getting getting complicated genes and life form and um, completely packaged and placing it on the earth. That is reason invading nature or or shining a light into nature, however you want to look at it. Um, and then every time something like that happens throughout the fossil record, and things show up, and there's no transition. And those transitions, there's no transitions for the beginning of life. And there's transitions lacking throughout the entire evolutionary tree. That's reason. It's not nature. That is reason. And that's a plan. And that's a design. And it is a complicated design. Even for the most simple life, that is a complicated design. So that's my take on it. And, um, and I was really excited to see this. And I couldn't wait to share it and 
and I have waited because I was thinking I was going to have to present everything all together. And I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? If you, if you can explain this, if you can explain, if you can provide evidence, uh, or, or a theory, even. If you are still watching this, me and with my pink cheeks and my crazy and this light going all over the place. Oh my gosh, look how red my ears are. My little dog is probably so hot. Are you hot? Are you hot? Baby. Thank you. Thank you. Is he too hot? Okay. I didn't even notice how hot it was in here because I was completely wrapped up in my brain. In, like, not in my brain, just in like all of these like cool thoughts. Anyway, if you've got ideas to explain it or other ideas or if you think it's as cool as I do, hopefully this got you thinking. If you didn't already know this, like yours truly. Did you already know this? Is this old news? Am I completely behind? Do you have other ideas or explanations? Is there evidence out there I haven't seen yet? I, uh, I'll be back with number two in my theory of everything. Good night! Oh.